tangential to my PhD research. The, the ideas in this absolutely were stimulated by Mike's abstract sessions will become abundantly clear as I go through this. By means, I'm not really in a position to add lib to my slides because I'm not totally in command of this content. Okay, yeah, weird title, Belford's Divergence. Um, or, this is the important bit, okay, or is industrial archaeology relevant in an AONV? That's the bit to hold on to. Um, uh, so, Mike's, Mike's call for papers for this session asks for contributions to discuss and to challenge the more traditional and newer approaches to industrial archaeology. And he references the debates that were carried out in 2008 at the conference and then in the 2009 volume edited by Marilyn Palmer and Audrey Horning, Crossing Paths or Sharing Tracks. That book's section about analytical approaches includes a paper by Paul Belford who's been knocking around, tag. I don't, I'm kind of not sure whether I wanted him to be here now or not, but anyway. Um, so, Paul wrote a paper in that book, and his concern was how English industrial landscapes were being addressed, and he challenged tr traditional approaches to industrial archaeology, as Mike encouraged us to do today in the session abstract. Now, I'm currently looking at two, uh, two industrial archaeological landscapes, um, as part of my doctoral research project, and so I'm interested to engage with Paul's contentions. Look at it works. Okay, so I'm going to use Paul's 2009 paper as a stepping off point for my paper today. First of all, I'm going to look at Paul's main call to action and where it might have got to so far. <coughs> then I'm going to introduce briefly these two industrial landscapes that are, I'm currently looking at. And because both are within areas of outstanding natural beauty, I'm going to look at the role of the industrial archaeology and industrial heritage in areas of outstanding natural beauty through their management plans. So sometimes I'll call them areas of outstanding natural beauty, sometimes it'll just be AOMD. Um, and in England you'd probably be, be familiar with that um, acronym, so AOMD. Areas of outstanding natural beauty are, after all, all about landscape. So I want to find out if my industrial landscapes are relevant to the AONVs in which they sit. And then I'm going to return at the end to Paul's, uh, the issues that Paul raised 10 years ago to draw some conclusions. Okay, so here's a, here's a quote from Paul's work. So in his paper from 10 years ago, Paul identified an ambitious, socially progressive and politically engaged role for the study of English industrial landscapes. But he also identified what well, that's this role here. I mean, this, is kind of, this is the headline quote really from his concluding paragraph. Uh, but he also identified a series of things that he called divergences. So a series of parting of the ways in research practices and perceptions of landscape, which in his view had hampered not only the study of industrial landscapes, but also archaeological stability and possibly their inclination to use their research to engage with the pressing problems of the modern world. So he made this call for arms, and I feel that this is echoed in Mike's question for us today. How relevant or understood is industrial archaeology and heritage in the second decade of the 21st century? As I wrote this paper, COP24, the United Nations Climate Change Conference, was underway in Poland, and I can't but help reflect somewhat ruefully on Paul's accusation that industrial archaeologists have ignored the part that their studies could play in tackling issues of pollution, environmental degradation, and globalisation, for example. Now, that's not to say that things haven't changed since 2009, although I'm not sure how much that's down to industrial archaeologists and heritage. Speaking anecdotally, for example, through the very narrow and self-selecting prism of my Twitter feed, I grant you that, the Industrial Heritage people, and here's one of my favourites, Crofton B. mentioned, by Andrew Wiltshire, they're just down the road from me. So the Industrial Heritage people are currently concerned with attracting punters to their Christmas visitor events, while it's the environmental historians who are making the running in teaching and publishing on sustainable development, colonialism, and other big issues that Paul mentioned 10 years ago. Now, I don't expect you to read that, but on the right, we've got... Um, uh, a uh, tweet, it's an excellent thread for the end of my energy history class this semester. It's about variety in France right now. Whereas the crossing B mentioned for people to go and listen to Brian Hutton talking about 
Christmas. Right, so it's unfair of me, it is unfair of me not to compare like with like. But it is interesting to look at some of the differences between the discipline of industrial archaeology and environmental history in the light of Paul's aspirations for industrial landscape studies. So this is the uh, front page um, of the American Society for Environmental History. And it's very clear in its mission and vision statements about the global impact that its research and advocacy should achieve. Environmental history is acknowledged in Lisa Brady's summation of the discipline to have a moral impetus of raising awareness of and promoting action to remediate environmental problems and their related social ills. So whilst you'll notice I think I've underlined it up there. The key subject area is human interactions with the natural world. This means that environmental historians are researching and writing on subjects that overlap with the materialist interests of industrial archaeologists, not the least being mining and quarrying, for example. In contrast, here in the UK, um, our own Association for Industrial Archaeology turns its potentially wide-ranging gaze from uh, society, environment, uh, landscape, and our future, onto, down here underneath, the minutiae of the material archaeological record. I'm going to come back to that difference in outlook between those two kind of groups of people in my concluding section, but for now let's just try to hold that thought and we'll go back to Paul's paper. So, I mentioned Paul's characterisation of divergences which to his mind have caused industrial landscapes to have been undervalued and underutilised in addressing, in addressing these, big, these big issues. I want to look at that in a little bit more detail. And one of the divergences that he talks about is between the practices of industrial archaeology, on one hand, and those of landscape archaeology, on the other. And Paul contrasts commonly site-specific and invariably urban industrial archaeological studies, like some of the things that we've seen so far today, with Hoskinian historical countrysides, landscape archaeology kind of characterised characterized from the, the 50s onwards, really, the way it was done. And there's both a methodological and an ontological dichotomy in which stereotypes about what constitutes urban and rural landscapes results in unsatisfactory accounts of industrial landscapes. And I feel that some of this is hinted at in Mike's session abstract. So forgive me, Mike, I'm not sure how appropriate it is to try to make a close reading of the second abstract. I'm also going to pretend this really is a close reading, but your references to the UK's volunteer on museums, to industrial world heritage sites, um, they bring certain images to my mind. And the likely presence of barriers that industrial archaeology stereotypes might raise, references to urbex and steampunk, stamp collecting kind of site-based behavior, they all suggest to me, rightly or wrongly, in a conflation of my emotional and embodied responses to your words, a kind of urban, grimy, noisy, heavy industry of moving parts, smelling of coal and steam, and covered in grease and oil. I mean, like, I'm in there, you know, there's me and Hoffman Beam engines doing that as well. I'm, I'm implicated in this. But it's likely researched and delivered by a particular demographic as well. So this is the urban industry stereotype that Paul questioned 10 years ago, pointing out that industrial landscapes are so much more varied in nuance. So for example, and I'm having you some lovely air photographs from my favourite ever artwork collection. Uh, this is a, a, a bleach work. So industry has always been rural. Archaeology in our countryside is never only about medieval fields and settlement patterns or prehistoric ritual landscapes. Industry has often been extra-urban or semi-rural, setting up on the edges of settlements, sometimes because a landowner had the power to invest, or maybe because there was a liminal space that was out with established control that could be appropriated for work, or maybe that's because that's where the water is, or, or, or whatever. Of course, industry, industry would have been urban. I, I just love the cement works at Hull. It's, it's, I love the way that it's industry, but it's it's pale and dusty, not dark and sooty, but that's because it's cement. Um, and industry has snaked its way from urban context to urban context via rural settings, as canals and railways not only pass through multiple landscapes, 
but they also create new landscape by affording ever-changing panoramas along their routes. So none of these industrial landscapes are even fixed and unchanging because they've all fluctuated from one state to another and sometimes back again. Industrial developments are historically contingent as well as geologically and topologically contingent. And I would add, both light and heavy industry have involved men, women and children in their workforces. And I'll come back to that later. So Paul sets up another divergence. Got urban and rural, which he, he demonstrates is, is really sort of false divergence, and we've just seen that in the air photos. He sets up another divergence between ways that industrial landscapes have been valued, specifically the difference between early modern landscape values and values of the more recent conservation movement. Industry as a force of progress and enlightenment, and a source of wonder and pride and social capital as well as monetary capital for early pioneers and innovators, has more recently been conceptualised by some as antithetical to the protection and continued enjoyment of rural landscapes, in which Paul writes, industrial activities are acknowledged only if well and truly relics. And Paul here points the finger at organisations like the Campaign for Protection of Rural England and legislative <coughs> instruments like the Town and Country Planning Act 1947 that seek to reduce historic industry in landscapes to become curios in a modern sublime rather than acknowledge industry's role in shaping place, identity, community, and ultimately the modern world. Now, the UK environmental legislation that Paul proposes is complicit in reducing the potential for the study of industrial landscapes to address global issues, includes a series of acts creating and maintaining areas of outstanding natural beauty. And you get these in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. AOMBs began in 1949 with the National Parks and Access to the Countryside Act, um, which has since been overtaken by the Countryside Rights of Way Act. But this is the current relevant legislation. So there are 33 AOMBs in England, one that straddles the English Welsh border, and eight in Northern Ireland. Now, AOMBs have a distinctive character and natural beauty that are so precious, like this is the official terminology so precious that they are worthwhile safeguarding in the national interest. Despite each being very different, they are described in terms of a common sentiment and aesthetic in which industrial activities, as Paul complains, are often well and truly relics, and so they should remain. Now, I'm not expecting you to read all the small stuff here, but I've, instead, of, instead of typing out the words as quotes, I've done screen grabs of these web pages just so that you can see I'm not making it up. This is really in, in, in context. <laughs> so this is this is from the North Pennines area of outstanding natural beauty management plan. It's their new management plan, so it's currently in draft status, but it is what's published at the moment online. Now, according to this area's management plan, it is wild, it is remote, it is tranquil. You can walk for a whole day and not cross a road. There is a relative freedom from human noise and modern visual intrusions. And without any apparent irony, the text, this text, is alongside a photo of a cultivated landscape with the straightest of field walls marching across the hillside. We go to Wales. Why they make these things so impossible to read? It's text. I mean, it's all about design, but it's terrible. So in the Cluidian Range, AOMB in Wales, the special characteristics here are its tranquility, its panoramic views, its sense of place and community. And if we go to the North Wessex Downs, this at least is in a font that you can read. So whilst the North Wessex Downs area of outstanding natural beauty is an undeveloped landscape, apparently, um, we'll come back to that in a moment, um, it's a place to escape from the pressures of the urban world. Now, coincidentally, all of my PhD study areas are within areas of outstanding natural beauty, which I didn't realise until I was starting to think about this and had this idea. All of my PhD study areas are in AONBs. And the two stone quarrying industries that I'm currently working on are in the Chilterns area of outstanding natural beauty and the North Wessex Downs area, so this one. And actually, these two areas join together into one huge protected area because they run along part of the chalk spine of England. So this is where they are. Both areas, therefore, share similar characteristics. They have chalk grassland, rolling downland, extensive agricultural land, woodlands, and they are studied with quaint market towns. 
We're going to go to the Chilterns first, so a little bit further over. So this is something that I'm looking at. So I'll give you a moment to take in what that slide really means. Um, it's a really big hole in the ground. Um, <coughs> so in the Chilterns area of standing <coughs> activity, you see, I'm looking at sarsen stone quarrying in South Buckinghamshire. This was an extractive industry that was definitely active by the 1730s. Stone cutters are named as witnesses, or as the accused, in the size court proceedings uh, by then. And the stone blocks that they produced were being used to build both agricultural farms and uh, stately homes around about 1700. <coughs> and then in the later 19th century, the quarries serviced um, street furniture. So in towns like Marlow, Tame, High Wycombe, Aylesbury, there are acreages and acreages of Sarton uh, street sets and, and curbstones before the invention of car mechanism and cement paving slabs. These quarry pits were scattered over the chalk upland and dry fumes of the Chiltern Hills. They were often up to 15 metres deep and they provided an additional byproduct, which was the clay matrix that these big boulders were being taken out of. They got turned into bricks in neighbouring kilns. Today, the quarry is completely invisible. The stone pits had to be filled in as part of a contract between the Sarton cutters, these guys, and the landowners. And the single most extensive quarry, which is a place called Walter's Ash, has since been built over with a housing estate as part of the Farmer Command um, uh, complex. So the industry is most visible by proxy through its products in the historic fabric of the region. But it's a bit different in the North West Downs area of outstanding that Beauty. So I'm also looking at Sarton stone extraction here at the boulders, but as you can see now they're not underground. Here this is this is predominantly in North Wiltshire, and because the geology is a bit different, um, you get the Sarton stones commonly uh, commonly lying about on the surface like this in, in dry coombs and dry valleys. So they're much more easily accessible here than they are in Buckinghamshire. And reputedly, this is what attracted stone cutters from the Chilterns area. To come to Wiltshire the, in the North Wessex Downs area in around about the 1840s, 1850s. But they made just the same products and they served all the neighbouring towns and also shipped them out further afield to Reading and, and Windsor. But here, huge quantities of the industry waste material are scattered over the downs uh, and in the dry coombs where partially cut boulders were abandoned and debris was left in the gullies and the empty extraction pits. And close by the quarry, Chalk and clay pits were also dug, and brickworks served the estates and local economies. So, in both areas, the Chilterns area and the North Wessex Downs area, the Sarsen cutters and their family members were engaged in a diverse economy. The male stone cutters were also farmers, publicans, and landlords. Female family members of all ages included lace makers and straw cutters, for example, on piecework and daily domestic servants, and laundry, and, and all those other things. Um, it's great going through the census records. Um, widows could become small masters employing the stone cutters that their uh, husbands had formerly managed. And the stone products were transported by road out of the dispersed quarries and where possible using canals, although in both areas the canal service is a bit limited, not like in, in Birmingham, for example. The business network extended uh, across and beyond what is now the AOA. And so, of course, it included carters and boatmen and their auxiliary trades, horses, supplies of their fodder, their tap and their shoes, blacksmiths making and maintaining a specialist stone cutting toolkit, and a whole host of other trades and trading. So, prompted by Paul Belford and his, his paper from 10 years ago, and given the dominant discourse of this idyllic, rural, empty, natural beauty of the designated landscapes, I asked <coughs> myself do these industrial landscapes? play any role in the management and presentation of the areas of outstanding natural beauty in which the Sarsen stone was quarried. And I thought I'd do that for today by looking at how the words industry and industrial appear in the AOMD management plans. Okay. So in the North Wessex Downs management plan, every instance of the word industry refers to a business active in the area of outstanding natural beauty today. This is mostly horse racing and farming except once when it refers to the loss of river habitats through flood alleviation schemes and pulse industry. The word industrial is used only four times, referring to heritage twice and current industries twice. 
But the industrial heritage that's identified in this AOMP is limited to active heritage attractions. These are the Kent and Avon Canal, the GWR Society at Didcot, Steam Museum in Swindon, Crofton Steam Engine on the Kent and Avon Canal, and Wilson Windmill. These all things with moving parts and sound and smell and you know, cool stuff that you can go and visit and play with. Archaeological industry that does not offer a visitor experience is absent from the North Wessex Downs Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty Management Plan. Things are a bit different in the Chilterns uh, Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty Management Plan. The word industry there is used six times in reference to the present day and four times to past industry. And three of those four references are to old industries that are still active albeit on a much smaller scale than they used to be. The word industrial appears three times, always describing heritage. But this <coughs> management plan, this management plan is explicit in its recognition of the AOMB's landscape as an industrial landscape. It says, in many ways, it is also an industrial landscape with relics, that relic word, with relics of early ironworking, charcoal burning, woodworking, furniture making, the railways and canals, brick and tile making, brewing, chalk pouring, and cement manufacture. And in addition, the historic environment section of the Chilterns management plan includes the industrial archaeology of the post medieval and modern Chiltern Hills. So there isn't an exhaustive in inventory of the range of features and sites encompassed by industrial archaeology, but its greater prominence means that it is clearly encompassed by the plan's 11 historic environment policies. So neither management plan mentions the specialist sarsen uh, stone quarrying industry, which I'm looking at, which although small, had such a big visual impact on much local architecture and many of the street scenes in each AOMB. But the Chilterns plan does acknowledge that the beautiful countryside, protected by its special status, is an industrial landscape. Despite the fact that the North Wessex Downs area also had ironworks and brass founding, brewing, timber trade, brickworks, and all these other industries in the landscape, they're absent from the idea of what the area of outstanding natural beauty is. Now, the irony is that in North Wiltshire, in the North Wessex Downs area, the protection of nationally significant geology in a romantic rural setting did as much to protect industrial archaeology as it did a beautiful landscape associated with our prehistoric past. In 1907, a national campaign coordinated by the Wiltshire Archaeology and Natural History Society led to the purchase of two chalk coombs on the Marble Downs full of sarsen stones. One's called Piggle Bean, which is the bit in red at the top, and the other's called Lockeridge Bean, which is the bit in red at the bottom. The speckles are all the stones that used to be there. So the campaign was sparked by the perceived threat that the sarsen cutters would soon split up and remove all of the sarsen boulders from this area. And it looks like this. Um, associated by proximity with the internationally significant Neolithic monuments at Avery and Stonehenge, the impact of the quarrying industry on the stones themselves was seen as a, a travesty. And in the space of a year, those two areas, those two dry coombs full of stones, have been purchased for the nation and handed over to the National Trust. The idea was to preserve the geological phenomenon unique to this country, not county, country, the whole of the country. So if you walk through Pickle Dean or Lockridge Dean, those two red areas now, if you walk through them, you will encounter part of an area of outstanding natural beauty if you look hard at the stones lying at your feet, you'll see that at least half, if not more than half, bear witness to the past quarry. You are standing in an industrial landscape. So Mike asks us, is the term industrial archaeology still relevant? Well, industrial archaeology is made relevant even in an area of outstanding natural beauty in the Chilterns. The management board's plan acknowledges the significance of the industrial past to the lived present. In contrast, in the North West Downs area, no, it's not so at all. The distinctive character and natural beauty that is so precious that's worthwhile safeguarding in the national interest, um, that it's, it's like this. It's this romantic, sparse, open and empty landscape, apparently. And that raises a different set of barriers to engagement and participation <coughs> in this industrial archaeology. Instead of off-putting, I said advisedly, instead of off-putting urban archaeology enthused over by old men in boiler suits or 
or younger trespassing urbex enthusiasts, the rural industrial landscapes share the countryside problems. So social inclusion in the benefits of the Chilterns AOMB is in fact identified as a problem in its management plan because people, people can't actually access the AOMB. Here on the North Wessex Downs uh, area, on the Marlborough Downs, it's accessible by foot, by bicycle, and the considerably more expensive horse, but is it accessible by wheelchair or mobility scooter, for example. The lack of public transport in the barrier it prevents people from coming into the AOMB, and they lose out on the health and well-being benefits that come from visiting. And for those who do visit, the lack of interpretive material renders the industrial landscape invisible. And hopefully I've got enough time just to fit this in. So this is an area uh, on the Marlborough Downs in the North Wessex Downs area about standing next to a beauty called Totter Down. So they once stood at brickworks. Here's the brickworks up here at Totter Down. It was beside the very heavily used ridgeway, which is that path going diagonally across the river from out there. That's now National Trail. There are clay pits that are scattered and around nearby. And this brickworks was operated alongside sarsen stone cutters and here are some boulders and a smaller stone still mapped by the Ordnance Survey. So this was a busy industrial landscape. There must have been a lot of movement going around there. Bring fuel in for the kilns, take the bricks out, that kind of thing. This is it today. It was a busy industrial landscape, but there is nothing at the top of the <coughs> to speak to this industry. So although it feels remote and peaceful today as things should do in an AOMB, I can't but feel that the North Wessex Downs area is missing something that the Chilterns area has actually realised is in its hand to play. All industry is highly networked in terms of physical networks and human networks, and the result industry isn't one thing in one place. The mixed economies of the sarsen cutters and the presence of industry on the downs is highly relevant to the diversified mixed business models that are essential to today's depopulated rural economy. If Paul is right, the reason that industrial landscape is missing is because of those divergences that he described, and because the industrial landscape is minimalised by the conservation movement. But I would add, harking back to the difference between the industrial archaeologists and the environmental historians, that this also has a lot to do with the difference between the way that our interest and advocacy organisations think about themselves. There are stories of industrialisation to be discovered in areas of outstanding natural beauty, which has examples of vibrant, networked, lived landscapes and as harbingers of the change, could inform community policy and management of development and climate pressures, these kinds of things. The archaeology and history of industrial landscapes could show us how it's possible to live with a greater degree of balance in the 21st century. I'm finished with this last picture. Yeah.